Kayla. Good afternoon and welcome to the series two personal responsibility, healthy decision making and focus on the future webinar. My name is Cindy Odom. I am a senior project man or manager with public strategies and I am the moderator for today's webinar. Our webinar panelists include Maggie Westrick with the Ridge Project in Ohio and Jane Anderson, a pediatrician from California. Maggie Westrick is the project director for the Ridge Project. She manages two collaboratives in Ohio and Southeast Michigan, providing sexual risk avoidance education to more than 15,000 youth per year. Maggie also organizes activities to benefit families in need. She serves as the president of Sisters in Service and coordinates the project We Care program in her county and oversees the Ohio Youth Congress. Our next panelist is Dr. Jane Anderson. She practiced for 33 years at the University of California as a clinical professor of pediatrics before her retirement in November 2012. And she continues to serve there as volunteer clinical faculty. Jane has authored numerous articles on pediatric topics and has presented lectures on adolescent brain development and parenting in the United States and China. She has received numerous teaching awards from medical students and pediatric residents over the years. Oops, excuse me. All right, our objectives. At the end of the webinar, participants will be able to understand the concepts and strategies for incorporating personal responsibility and focus on the future into their programs. Understand how to translate the information to youth, understand how to take research into practice, and learn strategies to incorporate into their SRAE programs. Before we begin the presentation, let's review the federal requirements for sexual risk avoidance education grantees. Sexual risk avoidance grantees must include these six components in their programs. In addition to these six components, programs are also required to include the A through F topics. The information covered in this presentation will address topics A and D. Topic A, the holistic individual and societal benefits associated with personal responsibility, self-regulation, goal setting, healthy decision-making, and a focus on the future. And D, the funda foundational components of healthy relationships and their impact on the formation of healthy marriages and safe and stable families. It's also important to note this presentation is attempting to address how sexual risk avoidance education programs can provide information to youth concerning the importance of healthy family formation in their future and what the benefits are from the research. Youth in the sexual risk avoidance education classes may come from a variety of family uh, formations, but that does not mean that the youth cannot and um, cannot or should not be aware of what the research says so that they can aspire to create their own healthy family in the future, whatever form that may take. The research being presented is in support of the goal of the SRAE program and its requirements. We realize different situations arise in all families which can impact or change the family dynamics. And now I'd like to turn it over to Maggie Westrick with the Ridge Project and she's going to present on personal responsibility. Good afternoon. I am so pleased to be here. I'm actually humbled and honored to speak for all of you today. Um, and I just want to start and sort of reiterate something um, that Cindy said is that the research presented today really is in support of the goal of the SRAE program and its requirements. And we realize that different situations arise in all families, which can impact or change those family dynamics. Youth within our SRAE programs and classes may come from a variety of family formations, but that does not mean that the youth cannot or should not be aware of what the research says so that they can aspire to create their own healthy family in the future to whatever form that may be. 
All right, so the first thing I'd like to do is ask you to get ready and just drop the, your answers in the chat if you would, please. We're going to talk about personal responsibility. So, 1, what is personal responsibility? I'll give you a few seconds to start typing your answers in the chat. And then also, what are the components of personal responsibility? So we're looking for what is personal responsibility and then what are those components? And I think I have to open my chat to see them. Taking ownership of the decisions we make. Yes, that is personal responsibility. All of that. I love it. A lot of you are coming up with like taking. Yeah, holding yourself accountable, taking ownership. Doing what you say you will do. I like that 1. So I agree with all of those. Accountability. That's a great word. Um, personal responsibility. Oh, you know what? I need to go ahead and advance this slide. I forgot my job. You guys, I apologize. Let me go ahead and advance that would help huh? if I had that up there for you. Sorry. Here we are personal responsibility defined really is the willingness to accept both the importance of standards that society establishes for individual behavior and to make strenuous personal efforts to live by those standards. So personal responsibility is setting goals and reaching them. And that's really exciting. Um, so just a note here, anytime you see a citation, all of those references will be located at the end of our presentations on those last few slides. So if you want to go back and find them, that's where you'll be able to find those at in the reference section. Right. So personal responsibility and how is it applied to sexual risk avoidance? Um, I'd, I'd like you to throw those up in the chat as well. So drop that in the chat. How do we apply personal responsibility? Within topic A, which is the holistic individual and societal benefits associated with personal responsibility, self regulation, goal setting, healthy decision making, and a focus on the future. And then also with topic D, how do we apply personal responsibility with the foundational components of healthy relationships and their impact on the formation of healthy marriages and safe and stable families? Own your decisions. Yeah, we have to apply that. We have to teach these kids this, right? How to own their decisions. Um, and how personal responsibility is like holistically, it's all over. Good job. I like that answer. Knowing what you value. Yeah, right. Knowing what you stand for, not being wishy washy. Absolutely. We empower students and their decisions are their own. They should not allow others to make decisions for them regarding their sexual activity. Yes. Yes, taking what you learn and applying it for yourself. I agree. Great answers. So personal responsibility and a healthy marriage formation. Um, federal legislation requires sexual risk avoidance programs to address each of those topics A through F within the programming. Focusing here on topic D, um, the foundational components of healthy relationships and their impact on the formation of healthy marriages and stable families is really, really important. So when we're looking at that and we're applying it to sex and marriage, personal responsibility means that young people should avoid sex until at least high school, graduation, or entry into college. And then we know there's that success sequence, right? So when applying the success sequence, we see that personal responsibility really means Let's graduate. Let's get a full time job. Let's get married before having sex and then let's start our family. And we know that research has proven that the economic stability. So that chance of living in poverty is 3% when you follow that success sequence. And I don't know if there's really any of us sitting out there that would be like, oh, if I follow all of these steps, I won't get this sickness, right? If our doctor said, if you do A, B, C, D, you're not going to get this sickness. There's only a 3% chance. All of us would do that. And so when we're in talking with kids 
and really connecting with the youth, that's something that we should focus on is that it's a 3% chance. And usually when I ask how many of us want to live in poverty, not a whole lot of hands go up, right? So when we have doing that, oh my goodness, the kids are, their eyes are kind of opened. All right, so unpacking these components a little bit, we're gonna be talking about healthy decision-making, we're gonna be talking about self-regulation, and we're gonna be talking about goal setting and focusing on the future. So in topic A, the holistic individual and societal benefits associated with personal responsibility, healthy decision-making, self-regulation, goal setting, and focusing on that future, we really wanna encourage the youth to consider their actions as it relates to health and well-being. So, you know, that, that whole picture, not just one snippet, but the whole picture. For self-regulation, youth are encouraged to bring themselves back to their personal center in order to focus on their own values and health and well-being leading into the future success in relationships and family stability. I think that's super important, being able to bring ourselves back with that self-regulation. We all know that sometimes we all need a little bit of extra self-regulation. Right, healthy decision-making. So healthy decision-making is really considering those outcomes, right? How do we help youth understand and how can they apply that healthy decision making in their everyday lives? So I have some examples of how they're probably already doing that and they don't realize it. So once we can show them you're already doing this, they're going to be like light bulb moment, right? Like, ah, I get it. So homework, everybody hates homework. Everybody, I don't know anybody that loves homework. But when they're choosing to do their homework, when they're choosing to pick a good time to do their homework and get it done, they're not waiting till late, they're not procrastinating, they're not just forgetting to do it at all together. Um, they're already focusing forward. They're already goal setting and thinking about the future, going to the next grade, graduation, maybe college. Um, I know I have an example here of my son. Um, oh, he, he gets mad when I, when I quote him, but that's okay, he's not here. Um, he was taking a college class and realized that because some unfortunate events happened, um, he wasn't going to get the grade that he wanted. And so he was within that drop period. And I thought to myself, just finish the class. Who cares if you get to be in a college class? But his goal is valedictorian. And so that was his goal and that was important to him. So I hadn't even realized that. I mean, I knew he was a good student, but I hadn't realized that that was his goal and that was his choice. And he's taking personal responsibility for that. Did he want to drop that class? Not really, but he wants to be valedictorian. And so he had that forward focus, that goal setting, right? Kids in sports, um, band, anything that requires a practice. So we see them um, really doing that healthy decision making and helping them apply that. So in sports, it's those kids that, you know, hey, you want to be an NBA star? Great. Let's look and see what people do. What is LeBron James doing? What did he do in high school? What did, I'm not sports minded, you know, what did Michael Jordan do? And how are they, they're getting up earlier, they're practicing longer, they're staying later. And so helping the kids realize that you're already kind of doing these things with a forward focus. You're already thinking ahead and thinking, gosh, I don't just wanna win this game or I don't just wanna get through this practice. I wanna win the tournament. I wanna win the championship. I wanna help my team be better. So those are some really cool go goals when we see the kids and we're able to help them start applying that. Um, simple as chores at home. So doing chores at home, I think really can instill a sense of a pride in a job well done in youth. So we see them, you know, if they vacuumed, and I know it's hard as moms or aunts or grandmas when they don't vacuum the way that we would, but when they vacuum, giving them a sense of that pride in a job well done, hey, great job. And and we're seeing that they're learning. If I do this, then I have my four, I have another goal in mind. I'm reaching towards something. And I think that's excellent. And honestly, we can even get as simple as personal hygiene. We all know that personal hygiene um, affects kids in school, it affects kids out of school. And so when kids are taking care of their personal hygiene, then they're making they're making a goal towards, you know, different um, social, I don't want to really say status, but a different social turn. We don't want to be the kid that doesn't small grade in class or who gets bullied because our personal hygiene maybe isn't the greatest. And we even know that personal hygiene is linked to overall health. 
So when we can get kids to realize and start making those steps towards even personal hygiene, that is that is goal oriented thinking and, and future focused thinking. And I think that's really, really exciting when we're able to do that. All right, so some of these healthy are these foundational components of healthy decision making. I've already kind of talked about our goal setting, self regulation, um, focusing on the future, and healthy relationship formation, right? So the ability to make healthy decisions really requires youth to be able to set goals and self regulate. That's tough. Um, but let's discuss a little, we're going to discuss these each in a little bit more detail as the slides go on. But there was a study um, by Roe and Mazzotti that study the effects of goal setting instruction on academic engagement for students at risk. And it's really interesting what they found. So the purpose of the study was to investigate the effects of goal setting instruction on academic engagement for middle school students at risk for academic failure. The results indicated a functional relation between goal setting and lessons, goal setting lessons and the students active engagement in academics. So I think that that's really neat that we're going to see that through teaching kids how to goal set, they become more active within their academic lessons and they, they start participating better. And I think that's a really cool thing. So we'll talk about that in just a minute. All right, so healthy decision making and goal setting and focusing within this focusing on the future. Um, we're going to really focus in on healthy relationships and family formations. And how do we convey to youth in an age appropriate manner that goal setting improves their future outcomes? So what we want to talk about here is I have some things that we're going to talk about incrementalism. So that's really like none of us get to the top floor of a building by just taking one giant step. We all kind of get there by chunking it up, right? We take the stairs. Some of us take the elevator, but we take the stairs and we take it one step at a time. So if a student has a goal of graduating and maybe it, that's going to be a hard goal, we're not going to look at them in seventh grade and say, oh, gosh, that's really hard, right? We're going to chunk it down and we're going to say, okay, well, let's start talking about that. What does that look like? How do we graduate? We're going to make smaller steps out of a big goal. It becomes easier. And as you attain those small goals, it's celebration time, right? So some of the ways and some activities that we can do that, um, are simple. We can help youth create a vision board. So I brought my vision board with me today that I created at work. And I'll let you see it there. These are all just things. Obviously, I have a goal for getting in shape, losing weight. My favorite one here is this one with the girl kind of looking the bull in the face, right? I want to be fierce. I want to I want to be fierce in what I do. So helping kids create a vision board. And I know a lot of us are virtual right now. There are so many online options for vision boards, for dream boards, for all different kinds of things that you can work with kids virtually. And then they can kind of create like this digital diary of their goals. So as they, as they check one off, they add another one. And it's just really cool to see that happen. Um, a family crest. So we know family crests from medieval times and from kings and queens and what all of that means and that each section means something. So creating a family crest and in classrooms and in the SRAE setting, what's really cool is that we can ask them to create their family crest for their family in the future. What do you want for your family in the future? You can also, this can be a take home activity where kids can create a family crest at home with their, within their family unit. Whichever way, it's really impactful and powerful to watch kids say, hey, this is what I want to do, or this is what I want for my future. Now we're goal setting. Now we're fo forward focused on the future and we can get them to start to chunk it down. Great. How are you going to get there? Right? Making smaller goals. We also have, they can create a personal mission or vision statement and not just, oh, I want to be a kind person, but I want to be a kind person, but how am I going to get there? So it's, it's a how, or it's a why and a how, or a what and a how. What do I want to be, and how am I going to do it? And we just sort of combine that into one cool statement. Watching youth um, brainstorm. Sometimes we have to put really cool words on the board, right? Give them some powerful words, big, big words. They like to brainstorm for words, and then they start to piece those together. Like, yeah, I want to be creative. Yes, I want to be successful. Yes, I want to be this. And they start to piece that together to create their vision statement. And I think that's really cool. 
All right. So healthy decision making, goal setting. Um, these are the examples we kind of talked about earlier. And like within your classroom setting, this is these are how you would pull this out. So we kind of talked about how would we pull this out of students? How would we apply this in the classroom? Um, how are we going to get them to focus that way? And I think those are all really like the vision board, the mission statement, just talking with them about their goal setting is really, really important. So goal setting allows youth to focus on the future. In the examples that we just discussed, goal setting is used to build individual pride. It's used to build trust within the family and friends, and it leads them on a path towards success. So when they develop goals, they're going to really learn some important life skills. We're not going to win. We're not going to achieve every goal. Sometimes we're going to fail and we're going to learn those life skills, but they're also going to learn how to communicate those skills. So when families, families develop goals, they navigate through what's important to each member of the family and, and they, and those each deliberate goals. So each family member is going to have goals, but then as a whole, we have goals as a family. And so they're going to sort of navigate through that and how it's important. And what's going to happen is they're going to build one of the most vital relationship skills communication. And I think that's, that's really neat to be able to sit down and listen to your kids, listen to your students, listen to your nieces and nephews about what their goals and their dreams are. So talking about self-regulation, um, we discussed earlier examples of how youth already practice goal setting, but talking about self-regulation, all right, this gets interesting, right? Because we're all used to those toddlers who stomp and throw fits and whatever they have to do, right, to get their way. And they have zero self-regulation and we teach them a count to 10. We teach them to take deep breaths. And by five, they're still having fits and we feel like we could just throw our hands up. I, I disagree. I think self-regulation is so important to be taught in adolescence. And even like as we keep growing, I don't think we ever stop learning different ways to self-regulate. Different people push us different ways and sometimes it takes different strategies to bring us back to that self-center and really be able to focus. So homework, right? I have a younger son who is so frustrated by homework, math in particularly. He puts it off, he puts it off and then boom, he blows up because he doesn't understand something or it's so frustrating and he's throwing his book across the table. Yikes. So the self-regulation comes in with that goal setting as well. And that was the beginning of our year. Now at the end of our year with math, he's able to just kind of focus and go, okay, I know this is going to be hard. I know my parents are going to help me. I'm not going to get frustrated. And when he gets frustrated because he doesn't understand what we're telling him, he's allowed to walk away and then come back to the table. Whereas before, I think we were just butting heads. So we had that communication. We had that moment where we could really communicate and talk about, okay, why are you frustrated? Why are we doing this? And then he said, I want to do, I want to do well at math. I just need time sometimes to breathe. And I got it right. So as a mom, I was like, oh, I get you self-regulation. I wasn't allowing him that space to self-regulate. Um, so when we refer back to those concepts regarding them, the importance of self-regulation and their behaviors is really in order to achieve their goals. You can't achieve your goal if you're throwing a fit. And so students who are defined as self-regulated, they participate proactively in the learning process, emotionally, motivationally, cognitively, they, they're engaged. All right. So keeping in mind that the majority of SRA education is done in the classroom setting, we have to acknowledge that reflecting on and modeling self-regulation is an important attribute needed for the educator and also an important part of self-regulated learning strategy for youth. This is an important topic for the SRA educator because it's not only self-regulation that's needed for effective facilitation, but it's also one of the crucial components that youth need to develop for healthy decision-making and thriving. So talking about self-regulation, it really is defined, it's right up there on the slide. Self-regulation is defined from an applied perspective as the act of managing cognition and emotion to enable goal-directed actions, such as organizing behavior, controlling impulses, and solving problems constructively. The act of self-regulation 
or self regulating, excuse me, is dependent on these several different factors that interact with each other. Those that are individual to the child or youth, as well as those that are external or environmental, including biology, skills, motivation, caregiver support, and environmental context. Um, self regulation can be strengthened and taught just like literacy, just like le reading a book with focused attention. Support and practice opportunities provided across contexts, skills that provide skills that are not developed early on and can be acquired later. So again, it's not over if they don't get it when they're a toddler. We can keep learning that, right? So with multiple opportunities for intervention, that's a that's parents, that's us in the classroom as educators. It's you know, there's so many opportunities. The development of self-regulation is dependent on co-regulation provided by parents or other caregivers and adults through warm and responsive interactions in which support, coaching, and modeling are provided to facilitate a child's ability to understand, express, and modulate thoughts, feelings, and behaviors. Self-regulation develops over an extended period, so from birth through young adulthood and beyond, because I'm past young adulthood, there are two clear developmental periods where self-regulation skills increase dramatically. Um, it's due to those underlying neurobiological changes, early childhood and adolescence. This suggests particular opportunities for intervention. So I'm gonna share with you a quick story because I have a few more slides to get through, but I was in a classroom where a student had gotten in trouble in the lunchroom um, and his baseball coach found out about it and said, you know what? You were rude, you're benched for three games. This kid was devastated. And so it was a moment for me to go, well, how do you make it right? What if you apologize? And he wasn't having any of it. Like he wasn't wrong, right? He was right, she was wrong. And about 10 minutes later, he kind of raised his hand in class and said, you know what? I think you're right. I think I should apologize. And then I said to him, I will vouch for you to your baseball coach. Your health teacher sitting here will vouch for you to your baseball coach. Doing the right thing, even though your coach may say, no, you're still benched. But doing the right thing, even when it's hard, sometimes has payoff. And so it took him a little while. But as soon as he realized, you know, we just we let him go. His teacher walked him down to the lunchroom to where he could apologize. And everybody else in the class was like, whoa, that was big. So this kid went from 100 miles an hour where he wasn't wrong and he was mad all the way to, okay, wait. So that was huge self-regulating skill, regulation skills that he showed there. All right. So the proactive learning process is really just kids knowing that they have a choice and they have, they're involved in all of these processes, right? They, they're involved. It's not all external. We're not the only ones making decisions for them and throwing everything in on them. They can make choices to change the future, to change their motivation, to self-regulate. So emotional, so practicing this emotional proactive learning process, um, this is really important as an SRA educator to model these behaviors. So self-regulation develops by building one skill on top of the next. At birth, it might look like the ability to be soothed when they're upset. And through young adulthood, it becomes the ability to empathize with your partner and really be able to see things from outside the box. Step into somebody else's shoes. That's what it looks like as we get older. Early childhood and adolescence are especially important times for self-regulation for this development to continue because growth and change is happening in the brain. But we can continue to grow and develop self-regulation skills with support and practice for as long as we live. This ability to grow, if you will, and the capacity for self-regulation is important as we, I'm sorry, is important as we work with parents and caregivers and schools to implement those self-regulated learning in SRE and guiding them to the optimal health. We also see this in the cognitive learning process. So self-regulation is significantly and positively correlated to social functioning. Students self-activate and self-direct, and they have efforts to acquire knowledge and skills by implementing specific strategies, rather than just passively reacting to their situations. So those might be the kids sitting in the corner that seem defiant, that are always questioning the teacher, but really they're just taking a proactive approach, right? Self-regulation, 
and its impact on a healthy family formation. Research, research has shown that self-regulation is linked to more successful careers, better physical health, increased levels of relationship satisfaction, increased levels of relationship stability. So all of those are super important. And then teaching self-regulation as an optimal health approach. So I have just a few minutes here, and so I'm gonna fly quickly through this, sorry. Um, a few things that we do to normalize. Um, we have an Ohio Youth Congress or a student leadership group where we can connect like-minded youth. So letting them know that the way that they think, the motivations they feel, their goal setting, everything is normal. Normalizing that. We also have coined a phrase, a phrase that's called DTIP. And so don't take it personal. DTIP. When kids learn to not take things so personal and just kind of let it flow off their back, that can change the atmosphere. That can totally change, really, it gives kids power at home, right? When they stop taking their parents personal, when they stop taking their friends' snarky remarks personal, when they stop thinking every teacher is out to get them and they stop taking it personal, whoa, like the shift that happens, um, it, it just, it's all right there. It's that self-regulation and that shift that happens where they're like, okay, maybe they're having a bad day. I'm not going to take this personal. I'm not going to start wearing the weight of the world. So being able to be self-aware, to self-regulate, and to be resilient, those are really the ways that we're trying to incorporate and normalize youth in their feelings and their emotions. All right, research to develop the SRA and the SRC conceptual models clearly show that the ability to regulate emotions was protective factor for adolescents to avoid sex. In contrast, so depressive symptoms and negative perception were risk factors. The reason it's important to understand both risk avoidance and risk cessation is that we're moving youth on a trajectory to optimal health. We need to reach them where they are. That's so important. Being able to reach kids where they are, being able to provide that hope, being able to say, you know what, maybe that was your choice now, but you can change, right? Being able to provide that hope. These two models combined allow programs to meet individuals where they are and lead them to a no risk status or keep them on a trajectory towards optimal health. Oh, did it? Oh, sorry, I didn't switch my slide. All right, so why does healthy family formations matter? It matters because being born to teen parents sometimes can have a negative youth, a negative impact on youth outcomes. Insecure attachments with parents or caregivers increase the likelihood of youth engaging in high risk behaviors. Impulsive personality is a risk factor for sexual initiation. Positive peer values serve as protective factor for youth. And so it decreases the likelihood of engaging in risky behaviors. Connections to teachers, parents, and other adults has a positive income on youth outcomes. Our positive, yeah, positive impact, sorry, not income. Living with two biological parents at the age of 14 has a positive impact on future outcomes and healthy decision making. While we realize that in the SRA world, that last one really is, um, it really is important. And when it works, it works well. But we also acknowledge that sometimes that's not the healthiest situation for youth. And so if they're in a divorced family or in a blended family, the idea is let's get these other things to work well for them. Let's make sure they have an adult they can connect with. So although two parent family is ideal, sometimes it just doesn't work. So that's really important for us to remember. And so that means I appreciate you guys so much for taking the time to listen to me. Um, I feel blessed with the opportunity to have been here. I also now want to take a second and introduce Dr. Jane Anderson. I am fascinated by her work and I cannot wait to sit in and listen to what she has to share with us. So thank you all. And Dr. Anderson, I am going to pass it to you. Thanks, Maggie. Thanks, Maggie. Appreciate that. That was very sweet of you to say. Um, I feel privileged to be here today and learning from everybody and um, will probably emphasize a lot of what Maggie has already said in my talk. So we're going to talk about the role of stable families. And um, it helps me to think about adolescents when I think about their brain development 
you know, um, we used to, um, we didn't know much about adolescent brain development um, until the last sort of 10, 15 years. And it's been fascinating. Um, I don't know if you know, but Shakespeare once called um, adolescents brains boiled and he said they were disruptive to their parents and that was back in his day. So nothing much has changed. Anyway, we know adolescence is a time of rapid physical growth and it really should be the healthiest time of life. But um, unfortunately, morbidity and mortality rates are greatly increased during adolescence. And most of that is due to their high risk behaviors that are started. And most of those high risk behaviors actually because the brain is immature. And um, now that they have been able to follow teenagers brains via MRI scanning, they can actually see the changes that happen over time and they're not really fully myelinated or mature until about age 25 and the car rental agencies knew this years ago because they would rent a car to people less than 25 years of age but now we know it sort of scientifically and we know that there are lots of factors that can actually impact brain development other than just growing older Sex impacts it, and so females tend to mature slightly earlier than males. There is genetic control, there are environmental effects, nutrition, experiences and activities can actually impact the brain development, parenting and family structure, and we'll talk more about that. Um, and I think it's really important for all of us to acknowledge as educators that each team's developmental trajectory is unique. And so if you're talking to a classroom of uh, ninth graders, um, they're each going to be taking in the information you say in different ways and processing it differently, depending on their experiences, their developmental stage, all these things. And so as you're talking um, to the class, it's going to be really important to very frequently sort of assess them. What did they hear? What did they understand? Um, I want to highlight, um, although every lobe of the brain is um, changing over time, I want to emphasize just these four areas. So uh, one is the hippocampus. Now that's the area that is involved with learning and memory. And it is very, very sensitive, especially in the early adolescent years, 12, 13, 14. Um, any toxins that come in, any drugs that come in, alcohol, marijuana can really impact uh, the development of the hippocampus. And so the cells themselves are impacted and they don't work as well. And the size of the hippocampus can be impacted. And so um, teens, for instance, who use marijuana can actually shrink the size of their hippocampus and their later ability to learn. The cerebellum. When I went to medical school hundreds of years ago, we thought the cerebellum didn't do much and maybe helped us move our muscles a little bit. But now we know that it actually helps navigate very complicated social situations. And again, teenagers may not be able to emotionally assess someone's facial expression and figure out how that works in their lives, but um, we can help as parents, we'll get into that. The prefrontal cortex is sort of the frontal lobe of the brain. That's really our CEO. It helps us with the strategizing, the problem solving, the reasoning, the moral intelligence, the self-regulation that Maggie was talking about. All that comes from the frontal lobe and um, it can definitely be learned and can be practiced, but it also hopefully will improve over time as the brain matures. And then the amygdala limbic system, I'm sure a lot of you have heard of, that's for the pleasure reward system of the brain. And it is also immature um, in adolescence. And so what is, uh, I've highlighted some of these, but I just wanna emphasize. Um, so adolescents um, look at somebody and um, maybe their teacher says to um, Johnny at the end of class, you know, Johnny, um, you didn't turn in your homework. I'm I'm concerned about that. And the teacher's concerned and, and, and worried about Johnny because he didn't turn in his homework. And Johnny goes home because his brain and his amygdala and everything's immature and his amygdala is not very well connected to his frontal lobe, which helps him problem solve and strategize. He comes home and says, ah, my teacher hates me. 
And that's not really what happened. What happened was he was misinterpreting those emotional facial expressions and parents can help sort of provide some context, hopefully. Um, in the pleasure reward system being immature, dopamine levels in teenagers are actually higher than they are in, we, in us as adults. But what that means is the teens actually require something much more exciting to generate a positive response of, oh, this is pleasurable. And so they need these high risk behaviors. And unfortunately, as their dopamine levels go sky high, those activities, those pleasurable act um, activities are much more likely to become addicting. And especially the younger the teen starts, which means not just alcohol use and nicotine use, but sexual activity started early is going to generate a lot more high risk activities. And then I've already mentioned about the hippocampus being easily damaged. So um, one of the other things to remember is this: there's entity called epigenesis. We're just learning so much about this. You know, scientists, you know, in the 1950s and 60s and 70s, they used to ask the question, well, is it nature or is it nurture? What influences a uh, person's behavior? And now we know the answer is both <laughs> nature and nurture or our environment. And so um, of our 30,000 genes, about a third to a half of them are actually involved with the development of our brain and our nervous system. And of those, about half of those genes contain what we call regulator proteins. These proteins within the gene can be turned on or off depending upon the external environment or what that cell is sort of experiencing. And that means that as a teenager, especially is involved in different experiences, um, involved in parents, you know, interactions, that teen's genes can actually be changed. And then ultimately later on, those that genetic code can be passed on to the children. So it's quite a fascinating topic. The good news for all this in my mind is that even if a person, um, a young person has had some bad experiences or whatever, within the context of a stable and a nurturing family, the parenting can actually help change the development of that adolescent's brain. And the teenage um, can also be protected by the parent who can, in a sense, become each lobe of the brain for the teenager. And so um, the parents become crucial. Now, um, some of the things the parents can do, um, in my mind, is sort of provide scaffolding upon which the teen can then build um, their experiences and get their brain development going in the right direction. The parents can protect the adolescent from harmful influences. Oh, gee, maybe we better not go to that party. You know, there's no parent going to be there as a, a monitor. Um, they can help with the teen with making decision making, strategizing, showing them the benefits of self-regulation and healthy choices. They can help them navigate complicated social situations. Did your teacher, was your teacher really angry or was she more concerned about you? And then I think one of the best things is provide for that adolescent positive risk-taking experiences. Instead of the drugs, the alcohol, the sex, how about volunteering? How about going on a mission trip and helping another person? How about doing outdoor activities like river rafting? Now, one of the things that um, both Cindy has said and Maggie has said, but I just want to repeat, and that is that obviously the research that's being presented today is in support of sexual risk abstinence education. And we understand I'm going to be giving you a lot of the benefits of stable families and for a teenager, but we understand that those teens and the educators and facilitators, we ourselves, may come from different family formations. And it doesn't mean that they shouldn't be aware of the research. The research is going to provide them that goal so they can have that goal setting that Maggie was talking about to say, well, I may have come from this situation, but I want for my family in the future to be different. And so that's why we're presenting this information. 
So what I'm going to be going over with you in the next few minutes is some of the benefits of stable families as we think about it for um, teenagers in particular. And, and as Maggie said, the references are all at the end of the slides. Um, but I also want to mention to you that I'm just giving you one or two articles for each of these topics. There's a wealth of information on each topic, and we're just going to highlight a few of the research articles. So um, one of the things Angela Duckworth researched um, teens who did well and who were successful, and she and her team of researchers found out that it had not really much to do with IQ. It had much more to do with what she called persistence and self-control. Oh, here come those topics again. And she defined that, or she introduced the term grit to say somebody's willing to persevere, to be self-controlled, to be self-regulated. Um, and interestingly, adolescents are much more likely to demonstrate persistence when they um, both parents are present. Here's another, two more studies on academics. So a meta-analysis of 66 studies that looked at the relationship between father's involvement and educational outcomes in urban children showed that fathers being present in the family was so important for both white and minority children and important for younger children as well as older children. And from a longitudinal study here in America, the researchers said adolescents and families with both biological parents consistently outperform their peers, indicating a stable family is an important aspect of children's outcomes. And an international study found exactly the same thing. So from 33 countries, the absence of fathers from the household is associated with adverse outcomes for children in virtually all developed countries. So not just academically teens do better, but teens do better physically when they're in a biological nuclear family. So from this study, findings suggest that adolescents in most other family types tend to have poorer outcomes than those in a two biological parent family. And they were looking specifically at physical health. Many articles have looked at emotional well-being, and we are fortunate in that we have studies from both the Great Britain and America that are what we call longitudinal studies where they're following children from birth, really, over time. And so in the study from Great Britain, father involvement at age seven protected against psychological maladjustment in adolescents from non-intact families. So having a father involved is just emphasizing fathers are important. And the same thing in the next study that showed that fathers being present actually help buffer teens from victimization. This is a study from Great Britain in one of their longitudinal studies. They showed that if a father left the home later in childhood and early adolescence, that child was much more likely to have emotional difficulties and conduct disorders. And both boys and girls had an overall increase in um, aggression, excuse me, anxiety and depression, and boys had increased aggression. Um, and then this National Longitudinal Survey, that's the one in America, and what they found um, is that father-adolescent relationship has an independent impact on adolescent psychological well-being beyond the mother-adolescent relationship. And again, this is the importance of fathers and mothers working together. Now, not just um, in helpful for teens academically and physical health and emotional health, but also they are less likely to be involved in the juvenile justice system if they have both biological parents present. And I'm gonna skip that slide for right now. They are also much less likely to experience poverty. The United States Census Bureau in 2018 said children living with a single mother were at much greater risk of poverty than those living with both parents. And it's pretty dramatic. So it's almost 41% of children living in a single family female led household were living in poverty compared with only 8% of children living with married parents. And some people call this, you know, the marriage gap instead of the poverty gap. Um, there's also the teens are less likely to experience um, 
uh, any kind of maltreatment or child abuse if they are living in a, a two-parent biological parent family. Um, that's some data you can look at later. There are lots of articles on the website, the American College of Pediatricians. They have lots of position statements that you can see there. The teens are less likely to experience intimate partner violence. And again, the, the differences are dramatic. Um, if they're living with both married biological parents, their risk of intimate partner violence in the parents is 19 per thousand versus 144 per thousand if they're living with a divorced or separated parent. There's less likelihood of sexual abuse. There's less likelihood of initiating high-risk sexual activity. So girls who live with both biological parents are much less likely to initiate sexual activity and they're much less likely to become pregnant. And in another study, the longer they live with both parents, the lower their risk of sexual activity. So women whose parents separated between birth and six years have four times the risk of early sexual intercourse and two and a half times a higher risk of early pregnancy compared to women who grew up in an intact family. And again, this is just something we can say to teenagers. If you want to have stable relationships, if you want your children to be living in a stable family, here, here's how you can set that goal. All high risk activities are actually increased in teenagers who experience um, a non-intact biological family. And so this is three different studies. It's a busy slide and I apologize, but you can go back over it. But let me just highlight one thing, the middle one. This is a US study, except for suicidal thoughts or attempts among younger adolescents for every high risk behavior study, Adolescents who came from single parent families were significantly more at risk than peers from two parent families. So we want to be able to provide this information to our adolescents so that they can say, what is my goal? My goal, no matter where I came from, my goal is to make healthy choices for myself that will also impact my family of the future. And so here we have some data that stable families help protect adolescents from short-term and long-term harm. Um, so the adolescent has an immature brain in conclusion, doesn't complete maturation until age 25. This places the adolescent at risk for more dangerous behaviors. It increases their morbidity and mortality. But the good news is we can show scientifically now that having two biological parents present can help ameliorate a lot of these risks for our teens and it can allow them to have their brain development mature in a positive way that is going to allow them to set healthy goals, you know, develop their self-regulation, make healthy choices so that their families in the future will benefit. So the take home message for me is the same as <laughs> all of you. Um, the best chance of having a stable relationship with a loving spouse and improve the likelihood that the children will have a, the best outcome is to complete their high school education, to go to college, become employed, or both, <laughs> um, refrain from non-marital sexual activity, and then reflect um, they can, on the benefits of a healthy family as they form their own. And then I just want to mention um, that there, there, is, um, there, there is a counterfeit marriage that we just need to be aware of, and that counterfeit marriage is cohabitation, and it does not provide the same benefits um, to the teen, to the families, to the future children. And so I know that's a little off topic, but I think it's really important for you all as educators to maybe consider saying to teens that this cohabitation, which looks like marriage, is not as beneficial as a married couple. Okay, well, thank you for letting me um, be with you today. I'm going to pass it back to Cindy, our host. Okay, great. Thank you so much. 
Dr. Anderson for your presentation. And now we're going to open it up for questions and answers. I know many of you probably have questions for either Maggie about how um, to implement some of these topics into your programming or questions for Dr. Anderson. Um, so if you'd like to put your questions in the chat, we will be happy to address them. Maggie, this is a question for you. Oops. Um, they want to know how do you how do you talk to youth um, about marriage in your program or marriages or if or you if do. you do. Okay. Will you repeat the question? You cut out real quick. Oh, I'm sorry. Oh, I'm sorry. That's okay. 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 So, oops, I'm getting feedback. There we go. All right. So the question is, how do you talk to youth about marriage in your programs? Or do you talk to them about, about it? it? You know, um, I think it's just to be open and realize that not everybody comes from the same situation. And so I'm just honest. I grew up with two parents married. My husband and I have been married. Um, we started dating when we were 15. And so sometimes I give them that perspective. And their eyes are kind of open, like, wait, what? You've been dating since you were 15? And so then they start to ask questions. But I, I come at it from the perspective that marriage is just like another really strong relationship and, and it takes commitment and it's hard work and, and that we have to be prepared. And so the life skills we're developing now as high schoolers, as middle schoolers, as college students really prepares us for marriage. And so... And it's being open and understanding that not everybody has the same situation. They don't have the life circumstances that I do. And so it's doing it without judgment, being able to talk to kids without judgment and making them feel like, you know what? So maybe I didn't have that, but that's okay. Like I, this is what I want. So just being open and honest and candid because kids can see right through us when we're fake. Okay. Thank you, Maggie. Dr. Anderson, we've received um, uh, several, several questions all relating to um, the distinction between marriage and cohabitation. Um, they want to know, do you have some research you could share to support the statement that cohabitation does not provide the same benefits? Sure. <laughs> I know we sort of talked about how we might not address that, but um, I think the best thing I can do is refer everybody. Um, there are two um, position papers that were are incredibly well researched and well documented at the American College of Pediatricians website. So that's ACPEDS, A C like college, P E D S dot org, and go to their position statements and scroll down to cohabitation. There are actually two very, very long position papers showing that children have better, um, well, Conversely, for cohabiting families, children are more likely to experience divorce of their parents or separation of their parents. They're more likely to live in poverty. They're, more, they're less likely to, to develop academic achievements. Really, in everything we've been talking about, the benefits of two biological married parents, they do not do as well if they're living in cohabitation situations. Okay, thank you, Dr. Anderson. And this is a comment. This is for Maggie. Thank you, Maggie. I appreciate the non judgment. It is important. So, so that is from one of the grantees who wanted to share that with you. All right, another question about for Dr. Anderson. Um, how do you have, and this could be for you and for Maggie, how do you integrate more information regarding um, relationships into? programs or having those conversations with young people? Um, I'll, I'll just, I'll jump in um, just to talk a little bit about when I'm in the office as a pediatrician. I like to talk um, and take a lot of what Maggie said and sort of make it very applicable and quick. And so I will talk to teens and say, you know, you are on a uh, journey. Your life is like a journey. And you are, you're walking down the highway and you're on this trip, you're on a journey, you're on a highway. And I asked them, what's one of the goals that you have? What would you like to end up, you know, doing or being after high school? And they might say, 
a beautician, you know, or, or, or a football player, whatever. And so I'll talk to them about what are some steps that they can take to get there. Oh, have you um, spent some time in someone's beauty shop? Have you been doing, you know, your friend's hair? What are the little steps that they can take to get themselves there? And then I say, what might detour you? What might take you on a detour? And so um, if they don't come up with something, I might say, well, what if you got pregnant and had a baby, if it's, if it's a woman, um, or what if you made somebody pregnant, you know, would that take you on a detour? Whoa, some detours, you know, maybe you smoke a cigarette one time, that might be a detour that takes you out, but you can come right back on the road very quickly. But what if you try marijuana and, oh my goodness, you um, get the a motivational syndrome where I don't want to do anything and I'm not going to study. Well, gee, then I might not finish high school and gee, then maybe I can't get a beautician's degree. And so I talk to them about the detours and how they want to avoid those detours. And one of the best ways to keep them focused on their goals is to draw friends around them who have similar goals. And then we sort of giggle and say, you know, what if you hang out with people who, um, cut class every day, what are you likely to do? And like, duh, you're probably gonna end up cutting class. So you wanna choose your friends wisely, keep your goals in mind and be, you know, avoid those detours. I don't know if that helps answer the question, but that's how I talk with teams in the office. Okay, thank you, Dr. Anderson. Maggie, do you wanna take a stab at that? Stab at that? Yeah, I, I'm gonna say I have high expectations of teenagers. Um, they blow me away every day. And so it's that whole self-fulfilling prophecy. If I expect them to be the typical teenager and it's, I make excuses for those behaviors, then that's what they're going to do. And so I always, I expect greatness because I think our teenagers are so cool. I, that population amazes me. And so just setting a standard for them of like, I know you can do all of these things. I know relationships are going to be tricky or going to be tough. We're going to get hurt. We're going to put our feelings out there. But I know that if you safeguard some of those things and you protect yourself and you have the expectations that other people are going to treat you the way that you would treat other people, right? It's going to be a two way road. You're going to protect some of those emotions and those feelings and the heartache will be less. Um, and so I just think setting high expectations because Every time we set an expectation, a teenager most likely will rise to it. And so if I set a low expectation, they'll hit it. If I had a hit, set a high expectation, they're going to hit it too. So I just, I just tell them, this is what I expect because I know you guys are amazing and I know you're going to do great things and you're so creative and so smart. And some of the greatest ideas come from teenagers. Sorry, I get really excited about teenagers. Um, so I just think we need to set the, set the bar high for them and the expectation high and watch them rise to the occasion. Okay. okay. Awesome. And your, your passion is, is very evident and it's so, um, it's, it's so refreshing and exciting. All right. Another question for you, Maggie, um, you mentioned a great study on goal setting and how it affects the future. Can you share that? Let me, um, are we able to go back to that slide or can I, can you give me just a second to pull up my notes from it? Andy, you're muted. Thank you. I'm sorry. I was talking to myself. All right. So we have lots of lots of questions coming in. We're going to try to address as many of them as we can. We'll also put the uh, ACPEDS.org website in the chat. Um, all right, so is there any indication that the international studies referenced are applicable to youth in the United States, Dr. Um, Anderson? Um, yes, so it, the, um, the really fun thing with um, these, the research in adolescence is that these studies have been replicated, you know, around the world. And actually, the first studies were really started here in America. Well, that's not true because Great Britain started their millennial study early also. But they, they're they coming up with exactly the same data. And that is um, that, you know, 
children, adolescents do better in stable married families, you know, the vast majority of the time. Um, so the, the main, let me give you just a little detail of the US study. Um, Dr. Blum as, was a part of that and Dr. Resnick and Dr. Blum's done research now around the world um, on adolescents and, and what protective factors help them. But it started with a, taking a cohort of about over 40,000 adolescents here in America um, back in the early 1990s. And they were interviewed um, confidentially by themselves Privately, they were interviewed with their families in their home. They filled out um, confidential questionnaires. They were really looked at very intently, these 40, about 44,000 adolescents. And then they've been followed. They're still being followed. They're obviously, you know, in, in their 40s, 50s, 60s today. They've been followed over time. So that's why it's called this longitudinal study. And much data has come out. Uh, from these that following these teens, but the first one that came out was in 1994 by Resnick, and they found that the teens who went through their four years of high school and did the best and had less high risk behaviors were those teens who were connected to their parents or to a, uh, a teacher at school. It's that um, adult teen connection. And that was the very first article that came out. And then subsequent to that, they've looked at, you know, the family constellation and found that teens do better in um, married biological families. Um, I hope that answers the question, but yes, we have data from America, but the data from around the world is now coming in and, and it's saying the same thing. Okay. All right. Thank you, Dr. Anderson. Um, another question, and this would be for you and Maggie, and I know she's going through her notes to look for um, the, the study that um, someone asked about. All right. So how can we address the topic about how children fare better overall with two biological married parents in the home, knowing that a lot of adolescents, a lot of our young people are growing up in homes that are in different formations? or um, possibly you know, divorce or blended families or single parent households. Um, and how do we make, how, you know, we want to make them feel, we don't want them to feel ashamed of that, you know, and, 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 and so how do we help support those young people um, through the programs um, and encourage them? Maggie, you want to take a stab at that? Sure, and I did. I have my notes on the study, so I will hit that as soon as this question's over. Okay. Um, okay. I think it's with tenderness and with love, and it's how we present that because um, that's hard. There are a lot of kids that are living in single parent families, but we see a lot of single moms and a lot of single dads doing amazing work with their kids. We see that kids are able. If we're in a fatherless home, if we were dealing with single moms, we see single moms starting to pull in other father figures or strong male role models. If the biological dad isn't a good, strong role model, we see step parents really stepping up to the plate, right? And being those strong people. And we know that kids, even in single parent families, kids in foster care, um, in those type of situations, we know that if they can make a connection with one adult, one positive adult in their in their sphere of influence that's going to that's going to be huge and so sometimes it's also parent education like hey listen i noticed little susie is struggling and if you had a relationship with that parent or with a teacher being able to make a connection and see where we can offer help if we're able to or where we can refer services if it's outside our scope of services but i just think we see parents doing a great job and it's really important to approach that with tenderness, with love, and with the idea that not everybody comes from the same background, but we all want to be loved and we all want to be successful. Okay, great. Thank you. And you did find the study? Okay. Yeah, it's um, so that study was by Roe and Mazzotti, and the name of it, which again, this will all be in the reference page at the end of the slide. So if you're not getting it, um, it will be in the reference page and you'll find it on the exchange in about a week and a half. So the name of the study 
is uh, it was actually in the book it was in was career development and transition for exceptional individuals. And the name of the study was effects of goal setting instruction on academic engagement for students at risk. Yeah, they put it in the chat. You guys are amazing. And so what they saw was the results of that indicated and remind you, this was middle school students. So the results of that indicated a functional relation between goal set lessons. And the students active academic engagement. So, once we started incorporating those, once people started incorporating those goal setting lessons, now the kids were engaging more academically. And I think that's really key. So, yes, thank you for asking again. Okay, thank you, Maggie. All right, Dr. Anderson, this question is for you. Can you talk a little bit more about the lobes? And I'm not sure what that question means. Ah, maybe um, the lobe, L-O-B-E, is that what went into yes. the chat? Yes. So um, the brain is divided into um, several different sections. Um, here at the front, that's called the frontal lobe. And then on the sides, there's the parietal and the temporal lobe. And then in the back of the brain, it's the cerebellum. And then deep inside the brain, sort of in midline structures, are the things we mentioned with the hippocampus and the amygdala, the hippocampus being the learning center, the amygdala being the emotional center. And each one of those lobes sort of controls different things that we do. The frontal lobe we mentioned is the CEO. It's really the, the, the strategizer, the planner, the thinker, the, you know, I think therefore I am type of thing, everything that has to do with thinking. Um, rationalization, um, planning for the future. That's frontal lobe. Um, and then each of these lobes is going to gradually mature over time. But in addition, each of these lobes is going to develop connections to the frontal lobe that helps you process that information. So just to mention again, um, the um, the amygdala, which is, helps us interpret emotions, it's our pleasure center. Well, as that gets better connected to the frontal lobe over time, it helps us think through people's emotional, you know, um, how, how I interpret their facial features. And it gives us a better ability to do that. Young teens are not great at it, older teens do better. So, um, and by the way, this will be a tweaker. Um, teens who are spending so much of their time on screens, on social media, they don't do as well at interpreting other people's emotions. And um, that makes sense to us, right? But unfortunately, it also impacts what we call their mirror neurons, which allows them to develop empathy. And so teens on screens don't develop empathy as much as teens off screens, and they've done a lot of experiments on that. But anyway, that's just an overview that I, I don't know if that answered the question, but maybe. I think so, thank you. Thank you very much. All right, Maggie, this, this question is for you. Can you talk a bit about how youth respond to lessons on managing their emotions? Given that youth are so emotionally charged, do you find this is a difficult topic? I think when I teach it in classrooms, we kind of walk through stages of childhood and then we walk through some stages of adulthood and I point out to the kids and I start asking them, like, how do you define a man or a woman? How do you know you've reached adulthood? And then I start pointing out, you know, we see all those YouTube videos of adults acting like children at Walmart or acting like children on Black Friday, right? And we see all of these adults having toddler sized tantrums. And so we, I, I don't just say kids have the tantrums and kids need self-regulation. We need it too as adults. And so when I'm able to start talking about that self-regulation, and I even give them examples of myself, when as a mom, I blow my lid, or at work, I feel frustrated, what do I do? And they start to realize that like, this isn't something that I'm gonna just deal with now and I'm gonna master. This is something that we're gonna deal with for the rest of our lives, that self-regulation, being able to center ourselves. And I think when we stop pointing fingers at kids and start opening doors to say, okay, let's look at, the, let's look at adults as a whole. We all are going to grow up and be adults, but how can we be productive adults? How can we be efficient in managing our self-regulation and knowing when enough is enough? 
And so when we, when I open it that way and stop making them feel like, oh, she's just telling me what to do. Right. Um, and I start using examples of like, I'm learning from this. I often have to remind myself to not take things personal. So I have to say, D tip, Maggie, don't take it personal. Um, my kids now say that to me sometimes. So they now have the tools then to, to like help their mom self-regulate, you know? And so I think that's really key is just taking the blame off of kids and shifting it to like, this is something that we need as a life skill in general. Okay, all right, thank you very much. Um, Dr. Anderson, this is for you. What are some ways that you can talk to um, young people about um, healthy decision-making? About healthy decision-making? Yeah. Well, I, I did sort of mention how I, um, how I do their life map with them or their life journey. Um, and I think, um, now this may just be me, but I love using examples from real life people that they might know. And so, you know, um, Clarence Thomas on the Supreme Court who came from poverty and who was raised by his grandfather. So, you know, not a biological family. Um, ben Carson, you know, who was the director of um, uh, HHS, no, not HHS, housing. You know, he came from a single parent family. And I love being able to give them examples of these are real life people that you can look at, you can see what they've accomplished and how did they get there? And, um, and there are books that like Ben Carson's written, you know, about how to get um, uh, accomplished things as a teenager. So I like to give them real life examples. I like to give them people that they've seen. I like to take them on their life journey to say, hey, what distractions, what detours are could possibly hinder you? And then what can I do to not get in such a detour? You know, how do I make healthy decisions um, choosing those right people around me, listening to my parents, um, you know, or a trusted adult who's going to be there for me and understanding that it is that persistence and that resilience that, you know, and, and the hope we give them that hope. I love what Maggie said about, you know, having high expectations for them saying that I trust you, you can rise to the um, expectation, which is why we all love those movies where they, you know, the teacher comes into some low income school and starts a chess club or a drama club or a math club or whatever, and the kids all rise to the expectations. And so to give them that hope, yes, I know you can do this. Okay, great, thank you. All right, Maggie, this one is for you. The question is, when when you are delivering classes and you have young people whose parent might be deployed, are there any strategies that you use um, for those those youth? youth? Gosh, that's tough, isn't it? Because there's so much that there's so much emotion in that. There's worry, there's anxiety that evokes so much in kids when they can't be right there with their parents. Um, I actually have a lot of. Um, experience of that because I have two nephews. My brother was in the Air Force. He was a career Air Force man. And so I, I, you know, I grew up with my nephews having that anxiety and the worry about their dad. And so in today's society, we have more technology to be able to make that connection. Um, but just being able to talk to kids and say, listen, like your parent is a hero. Like what they're doing is amazing and the service they're doing and being able to make kids feel proud about their parent being deployed is huge. It's not a negative. It feels like a negative and it feels like a forever thing, but there is a light at the end of the tunnel and they will come home. Um, and being careful with that too, because if we're in wartime, that's really hard. Um, my nephews were, were scared a lot. And so just being able to be there and say, you know what? I get it. If you need somebody to talk to, I can be here for you. Talk to your parents or do you have a trusted adult? Do you have somebody that you can talk to about this? Maybe even being able to connect them to other youth who have deployed parents is really important so they can create that support system. Because if we don't have the deployed parent or we haven't had some experience with that, then it's hard to say, oh, I've been in your shoes, right? When we haven't been. So 
I think just being able to have knowledge of the services around us, what's there to connect kids and just being loving and being able to provide that hope and understanding and listening to them and not just listening for the next thing that we're going to say, right? But listening to hear them. And so then we can kind of pick up on those cues that they're dropping for us. Okay, okay great. great. Oh, and here's one more question for you. How do you deal with youth who seem defeated if they have set a short-term goal and they've been unable to achieve it? How do you redirect those youth? Well, I teach in juvenile detention centers um, where unfortunately in one, I see a repeat offender over and over, right? And our goal is to be like, don't come back. I don't wanna see you back here. I don't wanna see you back here. And the disappointment when they walk in the room and see me, um, I think is more disappointing for them. Like they feel like they've let me down when they come back into the detention center, into our program. And um, it's just love, you know, like we're never, none of us are perfect. None of us are ever gonna get it right. And so now we know what didn't work. So you tried that, it didn't work. Let's try something else. Let's pick a different strategy. How can we figure this out? If, if it was drugs or whatever, you were trying not to do drugs. Okay, this program didn't work. What other programs are out there to help you not do drugs? What other supports do we need to change? And really leaning into that because we all, that isn't that how we all problem solve, right? Like, oh, well that didn't work. So I'm going to try something else and youth just can't see that something else. So sometimes being able to talk to them and open doors to be like, okay, but let's not do the same thing over and over. Let's pick something else. And it's okay if we fail, we're just gonna try again tomorrow. We're gonna start over. And giving them that non-judgmental, um, I don't want them to feel the disappointment coming from me. Of course, I don't want them to be back in the juvenile detention center. But I, I greet them with a smile and I'm like, hey, this isn't where I wanted to see you, but let's try again. Um, I want to just add to that. Um, the way our little brains work is if, if something, if we experience something, um, our partner yells at us or whatever, our neurons start going down certain paths. Like maybe uh, we get angry or we get depressed or we get sullen or whatever. And every time we experience that same, um, stimuli, the pathway gets deeper and deeper and deeper and more entrenched and we're more likely to just, that just becomes a habit. And in order to avoid going down that deep trench, we have to stop the stimuli way back at the beginning so that we recognize, okay, my partner just said this to me and I didn't like it. Now, instead of going down that entrenched neuronal pathway where I end up angry, depressed, guilty, whatever, I'm gonna change what I do, how I respond, what I say. It might even be, I'll just whistle a tune because I don't wanna go down that same neuronal pathway. I'm gonna set up a new neuronal pathway. And that's really what we're asking the teenagers to do. And what that means is we have to help them recognize what's the trigger. If I see, for some drug addicts, if they see a dollar bill, that's a trigger, well then, how can I not let that be a trigger? Now that's, I'm getting, anyway, the idea is on a more, you know, less serious level, what are those things that trigger me? I go down this entrenched pathway. I'm not, it's not a good decision for me. It doesn't help me. How do I recognize that trigger and start a new neuronal pathway, new habits, go in a new direction? Okay, thank you very much, Dr. Anderson. Okay, we have time for one more question. And Maggie, this one is for you. Um, let me, we serve a lot of youth in programs and how do you deal with um, special populations like LGBTQ youth? I deal with them like I deal with every other youth. Um, I, there's no difference. I I had a student in one of my classes who's, I'll make up a name whose name was Cadence, but she wanted to be called Caden. Okay, fine. You know, like my given name is Magdalene, but I like to be called Maggie. So I, I deal with them as students. Um, so many times there's so many other things going on that I, I can't see below the surface sometimes. And so just being respectful and loving them the same as I would love any other student. I was in a class where I, I did 
call a female with the pronoun her. And she said, oh, you're assuming I'm a girl. And I said, no, you wrote down on my form that you were a girl. So you told me you were a girl, right? But she was pushing me. She was trying to challenge that. And it's just simple as, as just dealing with those students the same as I do every other student. Okay, okay very, very good. good. Thank you. Oops, we appreciate um, your comments, Maggie and Dr. Anderson. Thank you so much for um, taking the time to answer our questions. Um, there we go. Um, we wanted to share with um, everyone some resources that um, Dr. Anderson wanted to make you aware of. Um, some really good books, The Teenage Brain, What and, and Why Do They Act That Way? Two good resources. In addition to that, wanted to bring to your attention that we have some continued learning opportunities. Watch for the release of a tip sheet that will be sent, um, released um, in the coming days to extend your learning on the personal responsibility, healthy decision making, and self regulation goal setting, and the impact on healthy relationship formation and future outcomes for youth. In addition, this afternoon, we will be sending out the e blast invitation for the uh, cluster call. On June 2nd, it will be a facilitated conversation among grantees. It's limited to only 50 slots for um, 50 grantees to attend. So uh, look out for that. If you do register, please ensure that you um, attend. And if you have, if you register and you're not able to attend, please let us know because we will have people on the waiting list. Um, fantastic op opportunity for you to continue this conversation um, on June 2nd. In addition, the, uh, we have a couple online resources we wanted to bring to your attention. The Exchange, which is an excellent, excellent um, resource for all grantees. Um, there's resources, the comment wall, uh, the list of events, training opportunities, um, recordings of webinars, tip sheets are all posted there. And then you can also assist, uh, request technical assistance um, um, from, from the TA providers, um, public strategies. Um, and to do that, you contact your federal project officer to request the TA and they will get you linked with that. We realize, you know, especially in this environment with COVID, it's been, it's been challenging and we're here to help you. So just let us know. In addition, um, another great resource is uh, the We Think Twice campaign. Wonderful, wonderful campaign created by and for youth. Um, there's numerous resources that can encourage youth to avoid sex, drinking, drugs, use, and other risky behaviors, um, and be active participants in planning for a successful future. Really good information there. Um, here is our contact information. Uh, please feel free to reach out to us. We'll be happy to answer any additional questions you might have. And the next Several pages are references, all of the research that was um, talked about today. These are the references for all of the research. Um, and that gets us through this. And I want to thank you so much. I want to thank our presenters. Excellent, excellent conversation um, and information presented. I want to thank all of our grantees for attending today and, and our federal staff and partners. Um, and now um, I'm going to turn it back over to, to Julie. Thank you again. Thank you, Cindy. Thank you all for joining today's webinar. We appreciate your time and attention. Uh, we encourage you to complete the short post survey uh, after this webinar concludes. Um, and I hope that you all have a great day. Thank you.